honored guests, respected elders, my brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Assalamu rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace, divine blessings, and benevolence of God Almighty be with each and every one of us. I wish to extend a very cordial welcome to each and every one of you to this, the Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, Canada. Before we start the symposium, we will ask our Kari Sirajuddin to recite a portion of the Quran, the Book of Guidance, so we can invoke the blessings of God Almighty on this program. Kari <clears throat> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبكفرهم وقولهم على مريم بهدانا عظيما وبكفرهم وقولهم على Thank you very much, Kari Sahib. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, would you join with me in welcoming the Council General of South Africa, Mr. Patrick Evans. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. 
I'm very honored to be with you here this evening to be able to share this very special occasion with you. I'm particularly honored to be here to meet with and to help welcome you to Toronto to one of the great sons of South Africa, Sheikh Ahmed Didat. Today start. <laughs> You will all have, know, have heard that we have recently found peace in South Africa, peace amongst all of our people. This peace was not found easily, but the first steps on the road to finding this peace were taken when we began communicating with one another when we began speaking to one another as equals. In speaking to one another, and I'm talking here about as amongst people who are as different from one another as it is possible for people in the world to be different from one another. In talking to one another, we discovered understanding for each other, love for each other, and in that love and understanding, we found peace in our country. And may God give us this peace forever. I hope that in listening to these two great men this evening, that there will be greater understanding between the two great religions of the world, that there will be greater understanding and peace in all the world amongst all the people. And I'm very honored to be here this evening to be able to share in this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Usman Khan, and I will be your moderator for this evening. As such, my task is to ensure the fair and proper conduct of this proceedings. And being a Muslim, this enhances my position, position of impartiality. And to assist in this regard, I'll expect all to proceed with due decorum. I need the cooperation from you, the audience, to ensure the success of this symposium. It gives me great pleasure at this point to give a brief background and biography of firstly, Bishop General Wakefield. Born Bishop General Wesley H. Wakefield, an evangelist who hails from British Columbia. He was instrumental in reorganizing the home mission, which in 1946 became the Bible Holiness Movement. This movement adheres to the common evangelical faith in the Bible, the deity and the atonement of Christ. It stresses a personal experience of the salvation for the repentant sinner. Membership involves a life of Christian love and evangelistic and social activism. Members are required to totally abstain from liquor and tobacco. 
divorce and remarriage are forbidden. It is internationally linked to famine relief, civil rights action, environment protection, and anti-nuclearism. The movement sponsors a permanent committee on religious freedom and an active promotion of Christian racial equality. It ministers to 89 countries in 42 languages through literature, radio, and audio cassettes. It was in this movement that he was appointed Bishop General. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome for Bishop General Wakefield. Sheikh Ahmad Didat. He was from humble upbringings with informal education. He had an avid passion for reading with infused with him the zeal and enthusiasm to debate highly qualified theologists. He championed the cause of Islam and have won the hearts of thousands of millions of Muslims throughout the world. As a fitting tribute to his monumental achievement, he was awarded the King Faisal International Award indeed a prestigious recognition as an advocate of global peace he has won the hearts of many throughout the world added to his accomplishments he has published and distributed over 20 books to millions of people at no charge he is the director He is the director of International Propagation Center International in Durban, South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, would you join with me with a warm welcome for Sheikh Ahmad Didat. My brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I would outline to you the debate, the symposium proper, the format of which is the first person to address you will have 50 minutes. The second speaker will then have 60 minutes. The first speaker again will have the final 10 minutes. And that will be the time allotted to them for their discussions. You, the audience, at the end of this time period, will be given a chance to ask questions which will be answered by the two speakers. These questions 
will be given from the microphones provided on the aisles for you. There are four microphones, one in the upper aisle on the right and one in the upper aisle on the left, and there are two in the center aisles. You will be asked to line in single files and to make sure that your question, your questions are addressed in a polite and proper manner and directed to the respective speakers. We shall alternate with the speakers one question for Mr. Didat, one question for Mr. Wakefield, and so on and so forth, in keeping with the fair and proper conduct of this proceeding. We will have zero, zero tolerance and we will expect your cooperation for if you get carried away then in fact you will be carried away and not by the Muslims but by both the Muslims and the Christians we will take you away and carry you away from the premises ladies and gentlemen I would like very much to urge you to have no adverse partisan activities. I expect that you will conduct yourself with self-restraint. That, in short, is the format. At the end of the first speaker, a lot of time as a matter of fact, before the end of the, is a lot of time, five minutes before, I will pass a slip of paper to him to remind him of his time, of the five minutes that is left, for his a lot of time. I will do that with both speakers. However, the last speaker who gets 10 minutes, I will give him a reminder for his last two minutes. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it is with a great sense of appreciation for both of these speakers that I compliment them and congratulate them for being of different religious beliefs they have both decided to share a common podium and to discuss their beliefs in the presence of all of us. That is indeed commendable. <laughs> However, Bishop General Wakefield, in a sense of perfect gentlemanly gesture has given the preference to Sheikh Ahmad Didat being a senior to him and having traveled the farthest distance to be given the opportunity and the privilege of starting the debate I will ask Sheikh Ahmad Didat to reply to this. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the first speaker will be Sheikh Ahmad Didat. Mr. Moderator, Bishop Wakefield, and uh, guests, auspicious guests, and my dear brothers and sisters, I salute you the traditional salutation of the prophets of God.
the salutations of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. In their words I say to you, Assalamu Alaikum. But Mr. Moderator, I would like you to refrain from counting the minutes. Just two minutes I want. It's not a part of the debate or the symposium. Two minutes I want you to allow me. I have some gifts which I have brought from South Africa for the Bishop. This book here, this holy book, the Holy Quran, text translation and commentary <laughs> see when we Muslims we visit our brothers we do not go empty-handed so I would like to present Bishop Wakefield with this book uh, with the South African gold as you see South African gold and I hope he will accept it in the spirit in which it is being given to him. Thank you for your time. God bless you. I brought with me an extra copy from my own ambassador from South Africa. This new South Africa of ours makes me very happy to see him seated with me here to give me moral support and as such I want to present to him the same Quran also with South African gold. I hope you'll accept it. There's only one little suggestion with these books. These are formidable books. They are encyclopedias. Would the technician turn the microphone up, please? Thank you. Thank you. These are formidable books, encyclopedias in themselves, and it is not easy for a person to wade through it. So a humble suggestion, at the back of these volumes, there is a very comprehensive index. And I suggest to both of you, my brothers, that you browse through the index and the subjects that tickle you, look at those subjects, it will make interesting reading. Now, Mr. Moderator, you may start counting the minutes. <laughs> I have been very, very fortunate that Bishop Wakefield has made available for me these beautiful books while I was still in South Africa. There's one here, Popular Christianity by Mrs. Christ Christine Booth. She was the wife of the founder of the Salvation Army. She has written this book. I read through it. Then these are the books written by the the bishop himself, the need of another re reformation, the Bible, basis of Christian security, all by the bishop, and this one here, Bible doctrine. And uh, since he had the courtesy and the generosity of sending these books to me, I made it my duty to read them. And. There are so many things which he says which, which I can't disagree, especially the ethical and moral side of whatever he says. You can't help agreeing with the man. But theologically we are at variance. And reading this book, the foundation of Christianity, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the atonement, the vicarious atonement, that Christ died for the sins. On page 8, he reproduces the Apostles' Creed, what the Christendom are supposed to be believing in. One section of it says that this Jesus was crucified, dead and buried. 
he descended into hell. This is part of the Apostles' Creed, as written in the book, that he was crucified, he was dead, he was dead and he was buried, and he descended into hell. Hell, you know hell? It's a Jahannam. He was descended into hell. Now, we Muslims, you know, we are not happy with that. With crucifixion, we said we can argue and debate. We can reason. But for Jesus going to hell, we say now there's only devils go to hell. But now, this is what the Apostles' Creed is. And as I proceed further, on page 40 of his book, chapter 4, The Atonement, under a subheading, the bishop says, the necessity of the atonement, why it is necessary. And in column 2, he says, all the perfection of the Godhead require a punishment for disobedience. Failure to exact the punishment would be to repeal the law and uphold evil. It would render God a liar. In other words, God must punish. The wicked or an innocent party, somebody must be punished. If he does not punish, if God does not punish, he lets you off, scot free, then say it would render God a liar. And in trying to prove that this is the theology of Christendom, he quotes that the necessity of the atonement is clearly taught in the word, meaning the word of God. And he gives biblical references. Among them is Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, where the Christian, every Christian church or denomination, they have at the back of the mind this phrase, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. This is the foundation of Christianity. The justification for God Almighty coming down to earth as a man and having himself crucified for the sins of mankind. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 40. So, I said, now let me have a look at it, let me read it. And I found this, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4, as it was referred to. And I'm reading it to you. Behold, all the souls are mine, saith the Lord. As the soul of the Father is mine, so also the soul of the Son is mine, saith the Lord. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. This is the quotation from Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. And I take it, Mr. Moderator, my dear brothers and sisters, that we take this as read. You know when you discuss something in a minute, you have meetings, you say this minute is taken as read and then we can go into corrections and explanations, but is this taken as read? Will you all agree, Bishop, what I read, will everybody agree that we take that verse as read? We accept it that this is in the Bible. Now I might tell you that this verse, very short verse, this verse is only 27 words, 27 words. To that 27 words, I added another 9. 33 and a third percent I added to that verse. And I, I can tell you, no Christian can catch the joke. Amazing. If it was the Quran, any one word that the person adds or deletes, you find a correction. Immediately. I had a 33 and a third percent. No, it's not one third more. I added nine words to the quotation and nobody catches the joke. And I'm offering, <laughs> I'm offering anybody who can even try to give me half a dozen, forget the nine, half a dozen of those added words which I interpolated. I interpolated into the quotation this hundred Canadian dollars is yours. Come, come. Anybody, you can tell me, I say I added nine words. I don't want you to give me all nine. Just give me half a dozen. And I give you this hundred dollars. 
Once before I lost a hundred dollars to Jimmy Swaggart. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the same book, same book of Ezekiel. So I had become illegitimate. here. I said, now let me really see it and see. I want to offer another hundred dollars. Anybody? Anybody wants to take it? Nine words I have added. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair, I'm reading it. <laughs> huh? Yes. What are the words that I have added? What I have interpolated in the verse? You want to say it again? Nine words I have added, interpolated in, in this verse, which are not there, which are not in the Bible, but I added them. Just to show us, look, this is how our people, our, you know, our fellow brethren, fellow Christians, they make a religion out of a phrase, the soul that sinneth it shall die. But they won't know the whole verse. This is only a phrase in the verse. The, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Seven words, seven words out of 27. But now I added nine more to that. This hundred dollars is a going. Anybody, anybody can say, look, Mr. D, that this word is not supposed to be there. You uttered this, you uttered this, you uttered that. It's not supposed to be there. Hundred dollars for you. Anybody? No, I don't think there's any takers. You see, this is what happens. I have been listening to lectures, I've been reading books. And everybody quotes this phrase, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And from that, the whole of Christianity is created on the basis of this phrase. From here, the Christian jumps 500 years in history. From Ezekiel to Paul, he jumps 500 years. He doesn't complete the verse. He doesn't read the whole verse. No Christian, no Christian, I have come across in my 40 years of experience, ever know the whole verse. He only knows the soul that's in it, it shall die. From there he jumps to the book of Romans in the New Testament. From the Old Testament, he jumps 500 years into the New Testament, the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, where Paul says, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and everybody is a sinner. As such, everybody goes to hell. So now somebody must come and die for his sins. So who can be better than God himself coming down as man and getting himself crucified? This is the foundation of the whole of Christianity. But now I'm suggesting to you, my listeners, that after the phrase, the soul that's in it shall die, it continues. But, they say everybody has sinned and everybody goes to hell. Whether you label yourself as a Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jew, anybody, unless you, Christ died for your sins, you believe that he died for your sins, you all go to hell. All have sinned. All, all means all. No exception. But amazing thing, the verse continues. But, with a but. You know what but means? Unless, nevertheless, however, contrary to that, God has said, made a statement. You sin, you perish. You'll be punished. But, but, if a man be just, if you are just, and do that which is lawful and right, and on and on and on, in one breath, up to verse 9, it says, He had walked in my statutes and had kept my judgments. To deal truly, he is just. He shall surely live. He shall not die, saith the Lord. There is a way in the verse itself. The evidence is self-explanatory that God says, look, if you do wrong, you'll be punished, but but, same words, it's a continuation, but if you do this and do that, don't commit adultery, don't worship idols, mm -hmm, you are just to people, don't take usury, interest, don't take interest, or in that case, you will live, you will not die. Physically, everybody dies, the sinner and the saint, meaning dying in the sight of God means being destroyed spiritually. Spiritually, you will not perish. Now, this motive, the soul that in it sinner shall die. The bishop reproduced this in this book of his, the Bible, Basis of Christian Security. Page 36, he quotes again 
again he quotes the same phrase. What he had quoted in the Bible doctrine, he quotes it on page 36. He says, in it, if con unconditional security is true, then it follows that with the sinner the soul sins, but with the backslider the flesh sins. Even though the Bible places responsibility with the soul in saying, the soul that sinneth, he shall die. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20. It was 18.4. The same thing as a motif is reproduced. It is being reproduced in verse 20. Where it ends, verse 4 ends with the soul that sinneth, he shall die. Verse 20 begins with that expression. To expound to you further, give you a further elaboration of this topic. And in verse 20 it says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And Ezekiel didn't put a full stop. He didn't know, Ezekiel or Moses, they didn't know about commas, you know, commas and full stop and colons and semicolons and quotes. Moses didn't know anything about it and Ezekiel didn't know anything about it and Jeremiah, none of these people knew about comma, full stop, semicolon, colon, uh, dash, quotation, they knew nothing about it. 1820, the soul that sinned, it shall die. Doesn't stop there. He says, the, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Father Adam sinned, he made a mistake for which he was punished. His children are not responsible for what Father Adam did. Neither shall the father be the iniquity of the son. In other words, Adam's children today, in America, I'm told there are 25 million sodomites. They call them gays. God will not question Adam. He says, look at your children, that rubbish, you know what they are doing? No, no, no. Adam is exempt from such reproaches. God will, won't ask us, your father Adam at the forbidden fruit, so you be punished for it? He won't ask you. Why did you allow him to eat? Because you were not consulted. Nobody was consulted. So God will not ask you. And now will he ask Adam about his children today, what they are doing? So look at your children, the rubbish, worse than animals, worse than beasts of the field. What the beasts don't do, your children are doing. God will not question Adam. Neither shall the father be the enemy of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Meaning the good thing the good man does, he will get its fruits, its rewards, its benefits. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. If the wicked man does wicked things, he gets punishment for it. But if the wicked, the salvation, how do you get salvation? One thing is sin is not inherited. In this verse, if it is the book of God, if this is the word of God, God is telling you in the clearest language the sin is not inherited. You don't pay for your father Adam's sins, nor will he pay for your sins. And the way of salvation, he says, if this is the word of God, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20, said, if the wicked will turn, means repent, come back from all the sins that he has committed, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. We say, that is Islam. It's there in the Bible, but we say that is Islam. This is what Islam teaches. But the Christian somehow is programmed to jump from Ezekiel with a phrase, with a phrase, and around the phrase he creates a religion to justify the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, let us examine the case, the case itself. The Holy Quran tells us as the Qari read, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا سَلَبُوهُ That they didn't kill him, Jesus. They didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُ But it was made to appear to them. So, that is what they thought they had done. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَقْتٍ مِّنْهُمْ And those who dispute about these things are full of doubts. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ They have no certain knowledge. إِلَّا تِبَى الزَّنْ they only follow conjecture, guesswork. For the surety, they kill him not. Most emphatic, most dogmatic statement that one can make. And the only one who can make such statements is God himself. Because he knows what is involved, what is true and what is not. 
So, the Quran says, they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. The Christian on the other hand, he says, look, we have a written record. How can a man a thousand years in time from the happening and six, 600 years in time and a thousand miles away in distance, how can he tell you what happened in Jerusalem some 600 years before? The Muslim reasons that this is God Almighty inspiring Muhammad to say the things that Muhammad is made to say and to have it recorded the way it is recorded. The Christian says, I do not believe in the Quran. If we had believed in the Quran, we would be today two billion Muslims. The Christians and the Muslims put together, both believing in Jesus, we both believe in Jesus, we would have been together, two billion people who believe in Jesus and Muhammad and all that would have happened if the Christians believe in the Quran. But he said, look, since we don't believe in the Quran, we go by what is given to us in our Bible. So the Holy Quran tells us, وَقَالُوا and they say, لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدًا أَبْ نَسَارًا that you Muslims will never, never enter Jannah. There's no heaven for you. There's no salvation for you. Unless you become a Jew or unless you become a Christian. In answer to that, God Almighty tells us in the Quran, said, Tilka amani yuhum, that this is the wishful thinking, vain desires, hallucination. We say, Bakwas, Barbara, don't get frightened. Kul. God Almighty tells us, Kul, tell them, say, say, tell them. Ha, to Burhan. Produce your Burhan, your proof. In Kuntum Swadikin, if you are speaking the truth, let us have a look at your Burhan, your record. And the Christians have produced the Bible in 2,000 different languages. 2,000 different languages. He said, look, this is what my Bible says. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. Allah is commanding the Muslim to demand proof. It presupposes that when proof is produced, you'll be able to analyze it. Otherwise, it makes no sense. You ask him, where's your certificate? Where is your identity? Where is your passport? The passport controller. So, in other words, the passport controller knows that what you're going to produce, what does a passport look like, and whether it is genuine or not, he will be able to analyze it. Similarly, the Muslim is expected to analyze his book. Hatu Burhanatun. Produce your Burhan, your proof, in Kuntum Swatikin. So the Christians has produced his proof. He says, you see, we are told in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Gospel of Mark, in the Gospel of Luke, in the Gospel of St. John, that Christ died and he was resurrected after three days. This is the book. This is the authorized King James Version of the Bible, printed by the Christians. Authorized King James Version of the Bible. This is what they call the Red Letter Bible. Red Letter Bible. This one. Red Letter Bible. Meaning everything that Jesus spoke is in red in this book. I might just share with you that only 10% of the 27 books of the New Testament are in red. Only 10%. I mean 90% are black. I mean not one word of Jesus. Not even a red dot is to be found in this book. 90% of the Bible. With regards to the Gospels, we Muslims, we say that you see there are, as the Christians claim, 20, they have discovered 24,000 different manuscripts of the Bible. 24,000 manuscripts of the New Testament they have at their disposal. But they also confess that no two are identical. Can you imagine? 24,000 books to support your book, but no two are identical. No two of the 24,000 are identical. They're all different. 24,000 all different books. Amazing, amazing situation. Then we are telling the Christian, they said, look, the books as you put them, as you write about them, as you address them, as you describe them, you say the gospel according to Saint Matthew. It's written here. Bishop, Bishop, Bishop said, it's written in the Bible, my Bible. The gospel according to Saint Matthew, the gospel according to Saint Mark, the gospel according to Saint Luke, the gospel according to Saint John in the Bible. 
Every Bible has that expression according to, according to, according to, according to. I'm asking why according to? Why according to? You know why? <laughs> because Matthew didn't sign his name. Mark didn't sign his name. On those manuscripts, Mark, Mark didn't sign his name. Luke didn't sign his name. Nobody autographed it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they didn't sign, they didn't autograph, and they didn't even put a thumbprint. So this is mine. Such a document in any court of law and in the most primitive country, any country in the world, such a document you want to present to prove your case, it will be thrown out of court in two minutes. In two minutes they throw your claim out. This will of your father, is it signed? Is it attested? Is it signed? No. Has it got witnesses? We say no. It says, go oh, rubbish, don't waste our time. The court will throw it out. Do you know that? These 24,000 books, not a single one of them is attested. No signatures anywhere. So I said, in any court of law, in any civilized country in the world, this evidence about the death and resurrection of Jesus will be thrown out in two minutes. But where is the fun? Let's say we did just that. We did just that. We said, look, I closed my case. Bishop, I closed my case. Because this document, Matthew, Mark, Luke, according to, according to, according to, according to, means he, they didn't sign it. They didn't write it. It is assumed. People assume that they wrote it. There is internal evidence to prove that they didn't. But we have no time to go into that. We have no time to go into that, that debate. In any court of law, it will be thrown out. But I said, where is the fun? I said, dismiss. The meeting dismiss. Finish. Go home. Go home. Look, I proved my case. That in a court of law, this thing, this evidence is not acceptable. And I know you wouldn't be satisfied. You know, you took all the trouble to come to this hall. I don't know what, what sacrifices you have made. And the bishop has come all the way from Vancouver. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair to me. To be gentlemen, eh? to be courteous, I said, let us now examine what is written. The Christians are telling us that on the day of the crucifixion, 300 prophecies, 300 prophecies of the Old Testament were fulfilled in one day. 300. You know what a stupendous thing, 300 of the things that were said. In the Old Testament, how is things going to happen? This thing is going to happen. That everything was fulfilled. Three hundred prophecies fulfilled in one day. And what I'm saying that the greatest anomaly, something inexplicable, that the prophecy made by Jesus Himself is not fulfilled. You are bringing from the Old Testament three hundred prophecies to prove your case, but Jesus Himself, what He said, that itself is not fulfilled. Amazing! You, you thumb-sucking, dragging from the Old Testament 300 different prophecies to prove your case, but the, what Jesus said, that itself is not fulfilled. He so said, what are you referring to? I said, you see, the Jews came to Jesus again and again. They came with poses and riddles. They were always trying to catch him out, make a mockery of him, make fun of him. Now they come to him in Matthew chapter 12, Verses 38, 39, 40. They come to him. They say, Ya mu'allimu nuridu an nara minka ayatan. Said, Master, we would have a sign of thee. We want you to show us a miracle to convince us that you are the man we are waiting for. If you are the man of God, then do something that we can't do. And something supernatural. Like walking, walking on the water. Flying in the air like a bird. Come, come, come. Fly like a bird or give life back to the dead, do something, man, that we can't do, then we can acknowledge that you are great. You are the man appointed by God. Sign. Sign means a miracle. We would have a sign of thee. Ya mu'allimu nuridu an nara min ka'ayatan. Fa ajaba wa kala lahum. But he answered and said unto them, Jilun shirirun wa fasikun yatlubu ayatan. It's an evil and adulterous generation. An evil and adulterous generation. Seek it after a sign. But no, no sign shall be given unto it. Illa ayata yunan nabi. Lennahu kama kana yunanu. Fi batnil futi. Thalasa tayyamin. Wa thalasa layalin. 
but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the son of man, referring to himself, be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. What happened to Jonah? The miracle of Jonah is my miracle. He's putting all his eggs in one basket. Either he proves his case or he's proved as an imposter. The only sign I'm giving you, only sign, miracle, is the miracle of Jonah. He doesn't say, you know, blind Bartimaeus, I healed him. You know that woman bleeding with issues, bleeding continuously. She touched me and she got healed. You know I dried up the fig tree from its very roots. You know those 2,000 pigs I destroyed. You know I stilled the storm, nothing of the kind. I healed the blind and the deaf and the lepers, nothing of the kind. This is the only sign, only miracle I'm going to give you is the miracle of Jonah. And I'm asking the Christians, what was that sign? The sign of Jonah, what was that sign? Amazing. People preach sermons, Jerry Falwell, Jimmy Sagat, 24 hours a day I see on your TVs, you know, they're preaching away, preaching away. But if you ask them, what was that sign that Jesus spoke about, the sign of Jonah, what was that sign? Believe me, I have not come across a single learned Christian in my life yet who can tell me what the sign was. I said, you see, if you want to know the sign of Jonah, you have to go to the book of Jonah. There's a book in the Bible called the book of Jonah. But it's a very difficult book to find. You know why? Book of Jonah is only one page. In this thousand pages, it's one page. You know, it's very hard to find that one page. You're going to miss it, and you're going to miss it again, you're going to miss it again. One page, four short chapters, front and back. It won't take you two minutes to read. But I'm suggesting that you don't have to go to the book of Jonah. Every person seems to have heard the story of Jonah. Jonah and the whale. The Hindu child knows, the Christian knows, the Jew knows, the Muslim knows. Everybody seems to know about Jonah and the whale. Any of you don't never heard about Jonah and the whale? Anybody put up your hand? You never heard about Jonah and the whale? There's one man there. You ask your neighbor, he'll tell you what this is all about. He'll show you. Ask your neighbor. If you don't know, ask your neighbor. With the one who knows, who didn't put up his hands, ask him. What was the sign? Jonah, Jonah, according to the book of Jonah, was sent to the Ninevites, a city called Nineveh, a city of 100,000 people, some 3,000 years ago. A city of 100,000 people. God Almighty tells Jonah, go to Nineveh and warn the people that they must repent in sackcloth and in ashes, meaning humble themselves before the law. Humble themselves. Jonah is despondent. So these materialistic people, like the time of Jesus, Jesus is telling them of wicked and adulterous generation. The wicked and adulterous generation of the time of Jonah. He said, look, if I go and talk to them, they'll make a mockery of me, they'll make fun of me. No sense in talking to such people. So instead of going to Nineveh, he goes to Joppa, modern Jaffa, Jaffa. And he takes a boat and is running away to a place called Tarshish. At sea there is a storm. And according to the superstitions of these people, anybody who runs away from his master's command, runs away from his duty, creates such a storm. Superstition. So they began to question, who can be responsible? because the storm is not subsiding. So Jonah realizes that he is the guilty man. He is running away from his duty. God told him to go to Nineveh and he is going to Joppa. He is going to Tarshish. So he is guilty. And as a soldier of God, as a prophet of God, is a soldier of God and he had no right to do things presumptuously on his own. So he volunteers. He said, look, I am the guilty man. God is after my blood. He wants to kill me. In the process, he's going to sing the boat to kill me. But you innocent people will die. Rather, you take me and you throw me overboard. And it will be all right for you. Because God is after my blood. He's not interested in you innocent people. They say, no man, you are such a good man, such a holy man. Since we saw you in the boat, in the ship, you are ever prayerful. Maybe he had the subhi, the rosary. 
you know, saying subhanallah, 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 you see, alhamdulillah, maybe he's reading hallelujah, 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 because Hail Mary wasn't there then, there was no Hail Mary at that time. So, this man is ever prayerful, he said, look man, you are such a good man, such a holy man, surely you can't be guilty of any such crime. Maybe you want to commit suicide, you want us to help you? He said, no, 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 no. We have our own system of finding out right from wrong. And that is what they call casting of lots. Meaning throwing, the, like tossing the coin, head or tail, head or tail. And according to that casting of lots, it came to the turn of Jonah, that Jonah was the guilty man, as we read in the Bible. So they took him and they threw him overboard. I'm, I'm asking. That when they threw him overboard, was he dead or was he alive? But before you answer, I want an answer from you all. But before you answer, I want you to realize that the man had volunteered. He said, throw me. So when a man volunteers, you don't have to strangle him before throwing. You don't have to spear him before throwing. You don't have to break his arm or limb before throwing. The man volunteers said, throw me. So when they threw him overboard, was he dead or was he alive? I want an answer from you all. Was he dead or was he alive? I lied. That's the right answer. You get no price for that. It was very simple. Very easy. You didn't have to use your, 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 your brains. You really, you know, to find out what was involved. The storm subsides. Perhaps it was a coincidence. A fish comes and gobbles him. Dead or alive? Alive. From the fish's belly, stomach, he prays to God for help. I'm asking, do dead people pray? Do dead people pray? No. So was he dead or was he alive? Alive. Three days and three nights, the fish takes him around the ocean. And on the third day, vomits him alive. So he was alive, 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 alive. When they threw him into the sea, he was alive. The fish, you see, the man ought to die. If he dies, it's not a miracle. Because we expect a man to die in a raging sea. A fish comes and gobbles a man. The fish is not a respect of a person. It's a, you know, Jonah, come, come. Oh, you are a prophet of God, come. Mm, come, come, come. Is, mm. is that what the fish does? Is that how fish behave? Eh? It just break you up into pieces in two ticks. Kill the man. Straight away. He's not respect. He's, oh, he's a prophet of God. You know, let me treat him gently. Mm, come, 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 Jonah, come. The fish is the fish. The man ought to die. Three days and three nights, suffocation and heat in the whale's belly. The man ought to die. If he died, it's not a miracle. If he died, it's not a miracle. When the two men will see, if he died, not a miracle. Fish gobbles the man, if he died, it's not a miracle. Three days and three nights, suffocation and heat in the whale's belly. If he died, it's not a miracle. So this is the miracle of miracle. The most outstanding miracle in the Bible. Three times over. Over. Impossibility upon impossibility upon impossibility. A miracle is an impossibility. And this is an impossibility three times over. So Jesus says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Just like Jonah. What happened to Jonah is going to happen to me. And, and I'm asking my Christian brother, as I do my brother Wakefield. That in your language, sir, this English I'm speaking is a foreign language that the Reverend discovered, Bishop discovered. Say, I'm a man from the Bombay province in India and I speak Gujarati, he knows all that. English is a foreign language to me. Now, it is your mother tongue. And those of you who speak English as a mother tongue, I'm asking you all, in your language, I'm asking that Jesus, Jesus, in the tomb, after his alleged crucifixion, was he dead or was he alive? The Christian says, the Christian says he was dead. He was dead for three days and three nights. You ask any Christian, Jesus was dead. Jonah is alive for three days and three nights. 
I'm asking in your language, is that like Jonah or unlike Jonah? In your language. Jesus is dead, Jonah is alive. Is that like Jonah or unlike Jonah? Huh? Unlike. It's unlike Jonah. They're unlike. One is dead, one is alive. Three days and three nights, three days and three nights. So I said, and Jesus said, I'll be like Jonah. Hakaza, just like that. In Afrikaans, someone says, Yona. Suas Yona, just like Yona. In the Zulu, say, Ngoba, Jengo Chona, just like Jonah. In every language of the world, it is so explicit, it is so clear that he will be like Jonah, and the whole Christian world says that he was not like Jonah. So I'm asking, who is not speaking the truth, Jesus or you? Your Lord says he'll be like Jonah, and you telling me that he was not like Jonah. Was he lying? Was he lying? I can't believe that he was lying. A mighty messenger of God, a prophet of God. You say he's a son of God. I said, right, okay. Was he lying to the people? What's the answer? I said, no, you can't be lying. Maybe you got it all wrong. The Christian world, you have got it all wrong. Because he's not like Jonah. And he said he will be like Jonah. And it's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle that the man, when you expect him to be dead, he's alive. This, what I discussed with you just now, is available in this little pamphlet form. What was the sign of Jonah? And I understand it's being sold outside. I don't know for how much, I don't know. These are 12 small pages, 12 pages, 12 pages. And if you master this, 12 pages, this argument that I gave to you just now, from this little booklet, as a reminder, there isn't a Christian born who can argue and debate with you about the death and resurrection of Jesus. Just this book alone. This is dynamite. This is the laser gun of the intellect. You talk, you reason, you say, come and tell me now, was Jesus like Jonah? He said he will be like Jonah, and the whole Christian world says he's unlike Jonah. What does that prove? That the man was not a true messenger of God. He was not a true prophet of God. He was an imposter. That's what it implies. The man was lying. He was bluffing. I said, no, Jesus didn't bluff. He doesn't bluff. We believe that he was a mighty messenger of God, and whatever he said, he spoke the truth. Now, after the alleged crucifixion, Saturday morning, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, one of his disciples, lady disciples. What did she go there for? Why did she go to the tomb? So John, chapter 20, verse 1, he tells us that she went to anoint him three days after the crucifixion, the alleged crucifixion. She goes to anoint him. The Hebrew word for anoint is masaha. Masaha means to rub, to massage, to anoint. The Arabic word is masih, from the word masaha. The Hebrew word is messiah, from the word masaha, means to rub, to massage, to anoint. So I'm asking whether Jews massage dead bodies after three days, do they? She went to anoint him. That's what the word says. In Hebrew is masaha. She went to do masaha. Said, do Jews massage dead bodies after three days? You know within three hours rigor mortis sets in. The hardening of the cells, the decomposition starts taking place. In three days time the body is fermenting from inside. Such a fermenting body you go and massage it fall to pieces. Does it make sense? That she went to go and massage a dead rotting body? Give a massage. Huh? We Muslims, we are the closest to the Jew. Do we massage dead bodies after three days? Do we? No. And I'm asking the Christians, whether you Christian massage dead bodies after three days. Do you? The, the Christian, any Christian, any Christian, I don't know. I said, whether Christians massage dead bodies after three days, do they? The Christians, do they massage dead bodies after three days? Do they? Dead body, rotting body, do they go and massage it? With olive oil or anything else? No. <laughs> So Mary Magdalene, the Bible says she went to anoint him. I'm only using the internal evidence of the Bible. I'm not going outside, my cleverness. Or well, this philosopher said this and that, scientist said that, nothing of the kind. I'm only using the internal evidence of the Bible. The evidence derived from the words themselves. Nothing from the outside, no cleverness here. 
I'm only reading to you in the authorized King James Version, what is called the King's English or the Queen's English, simple, basic language. <coughs> so, she wants to massage, anoint Jesus. And she's worried that who, the stone, she had seen a stone being put in the mouth of the sepulcher, the tomb. It was not a grave, it was not a grave. It was a tomb carved out of a rock. According to Jim Bishop, a Christian learned man, he says the size of the tomb was five feet wide by seven feet high by 15 feet deep with a ledge or ledges inside. Jim Bishop, that's what he did. Five feet wide, seven feet high, 15 feet deep with a ledge or ledges inside. So she's worried now, she said, look, there was a stone put on, who's going to remove the stone? Because she's a lady, frail woman. But when she reaches the tomb, she's pleasantly surprised that the stone is already removed. The stone is already removed. I will answer your question, sir. The stone is already removed. She peeps inside. And she sees the winding sheets inside. And she starts to cry. It's an anti-climax. Anti-climax to what she had expected. She expected to find Jesus there. But instead she finds that only sheets. The man is missing. So she starts to cry. Jesus was watching her from wherever he was. Not from heaven, but from this earth. This tomb was a privately owned property belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a very rich influential disciple of Jesus, who could afford to carve out of rock a big roomy chamber. Around this tomb was his vegetable garden and perhaps his gardener's quarters and his country home where he went during the weekends for holiday. Jesus is there, he's watching this woman and he comes up to her and he says, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? What are you crying for? Who are you looking for? The Bible says, she's supposing him to be the gardener. I'm asking why does she, she suppose he's a gardener? Do resurrected bodies look like gardeners? Do they? I said, because he's disguised as a gardener. Why is he disguised as a gardener? I said, because he's afraid of the Jews. Why is he afraid of the Jews? Because he didn't die and he didn't conquer death. If he had died and if he had conquered death, there's no need to be afraid anymore. Why not? Because the dead can't die twice. Once you're dead, the Bible says, it is ordained unto all men once to die and after that the judgment. You can't die twice. But he's, she's supposing him to be the gardener. says, Sir, if you have taken him hence, tell me where have you laid him to rest, to relax, to recuperate? Where have you laid him that I might take him away? I'm only reading what the Bible says, this simple English. That I alone, one woman carrying a dead body, a rotting body, at least a 160 pounder, you know, a young carpenter by profession, and then 100 pound of weight of medicants that we around in 260 pounds, and this woman is going to carry him like a bundle of straw, and I said, take him where, bury him as a hood like the grave. Carrying is one thing, an American superwoman might be able to do that, you know, carrying a dead rotten corpse, but to bury means she's going to throw it in a hole. Does it make sense? She says, no. So I said, what does she want to do? So she's supposing him, the gardener says, Sir, if you have taken him in hands, tell me where have you laid him so that I, my, I alone, might take him, not it, away. The joke has gone too far. So Jesus says, Mary, the way he said Mary, she caught the joke that this is Jesus. She was used to listening to him, addressing her, Mary, the way he says Mary, this was quite distinct from what somebody else can say. So she recognized him, so she wants to grab him to pay respects. So he says, touch me not, don't touch me, for I am not yet ascended into my father, meaning I am not dead yet. That is in the language of the Jew, I am not dead yet. I said, is she blind? Can't she see the man standing there beside her? What does it mean I am not dead yet when he's there? No, he's proving to her that he is himself, he is himself, he is himself. My time is up. I don't know how time flies here. You know, seems to be something different from South Africa. You know, maybe it's a sound system. You know, this, I have to wait for this sound to travel to you people. You know, the words as they're coming out. I can't speak as fast as I could speak in South Africa because the sound seems to reach everybody 
instantaneously. So, thank you very much for... Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Didat. And I might add, while you were busy talking, Mr. Wakefield was busy writing. So, ladies and gentlemen, on the topic, was Christ crucified to address you, Bishop General Wakefield. I would like you for a moment to not think of me as any title at all. I am your brother. I am your brother in the flesh. God has made of one flesh all nations that dwell on the face of the earth. You are my brothers and sisters. And I come to you not as some, not as some great position, believe me. If you want to find out, we are a very small group. You know, the old lady said there was denominations in her town, and then she said there was some churches and sects and then she said some of the fellows were so small they were just insects well I'm among the insects but I want to come to you as a messenger and as a servant of God and in that way I greet you each one I, I wish I could get this fellow to join me he would make a great speaker God bless him thank you But I really appreciated Brother Didat's kind gift. Thank you so much. I would address you in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Amen. Amen. As we enter this, I would like to talk to you and give you an overview of a committed Christian view. I am not a popular Christian. Popular Christianity, nominal Christianity, I have no part of. Let them hang, fell for themselves. But my end is a committed Christian view. Was Jesus crucified? This hinges on another point and Brother Didat very well brought it out at the first. It hinges on the view of the atonement. But let me begin with something that may be, be appreciated by us all, whether we be a Jew, whether we be Islamic, or whether we be a Christian. You remember the story of Abraham when he offered up his son by the word of God and when he was about to slay his son, an angel spoke to him and said, Abraham, I've seen your faith. I've seen your determination. I've seen your obedience. And he provided a substitute for the son. The Koran has several translations in the English language. Unfortunately, I cannot read Arabic. I can't even read my mother tongue of Irish. So I'm a little handicapped, am I? But in the, there it says that this sacrifice was a great ransom, a costly ransom, a tremendous ransom, a momentous ransom. And with that, I agree. In fact, when I look at Abraham, let's take away the labels from ourselves for a moment. Because some of us, we think, oh, Islam is our label. Muslim is our label. Let me suggest to you that every one of us need to submit to God. That is where we need to find the will of God, the whole will of God, nothing less, nothing else, nothing but, nothing short of that, and nothing more than that. And Abraham found that. And in that he gives an example to the faithful. I don't care who you are, if that is your determination to seek God with all your heart, you will be found of Him, and He will find you. 
But in this story, he gives this emphasis of a what happened. There came a a little ram in the thicket that took the place of the son. It was a substitute. It was a ransom. Now we know that in one sense no little animal is truly a ransom for anyone and this was a sin offering. I didn't say so, the Word of God says so. And in this sin offering it gave a picture of something greater to come. That is the Christian viewpoint. And then we find in the, we find one problem in man's life. Sin must either be punished or pardoned. This is the truth. And you might say, well now we're here, we're here like a jury, are we not? But I'm going to fire you off the jury. You're no longer on the jury. We are here, truth is not on trial. You and I are on trial, God is our judge. And someday we all have to face that judge with an account of the deeds done in our body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. Now in our course of discourses tonight you'll find some things that we agree with and some things you'll vastly differ with. But all I ask you is to submit them in earnest prayer to God and say, God lead me. Help me to submit to thy will. I have no other request of you. But as he, he looked upon this, he saw here not only man's accountability to God, that's not only what we teach, we teach the problem of sin. And when I go to God at the final judgment, which I believe is imminent, it can happen any time. It can happen the moment I die. That is my next event, is it not? In that final judgment, I won't go there to be a partner with God. I can't have the presumption to say, look, I've been in the ministry. It's worth something. It's worth so many brownie points. It isn't, friends. All that we do, all of the good we do, is only by the grace of God and by the help of God. Someone, are, can you hear me? Good. I can raise my voice as, as well as my <laughs> All right. It's only by the grace and help of God that this happens. But what do we mean by the grace of God? It means that somewhere I must find not an equality of a trade with God, but God's forgiveness. I was deeply touched by the one whom many of you respect as the prophet Muhammad, who during his lifetime wiped out the curse of idolatry throughout the whole region that he was laboring in. And that is a curse. But when he was dying, he cast himself upon a merciful God, upon God's graciousness, and upon God's pardon. And actually, any one of us, when we come to face God, no matter what we've done, that is where we stand. But sin, in order to be pardoned, we have a, a not only a gracious God, but a holy God. One without spot, without what, any wrinkle. And that is where there must be some satisfaction of the law of God. I have a law. You break the law, you're punished. Is that right? All right, in order for that punishment to be removed, someone has to satisfy the claim of justice in order for that punishment to be removed. That's where we speak. That's why we speak. That there is no difference for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. That's in the book of Romans, in the Holy Scriptures. And in that book, the reason he said there was no difference was there were so many said, well, because I am such and such, because I belong to such and such, therefore I am uh, much better. But this law had to be satisfied. No, the ancient Jews, they, they had a sacrifice, a sacrifice of atonement. They had a sin offering, a transgression offering, and they, they were seeking the mercies of God 
recognizing that they could not obtain these mercies on their own worth. But this offering symbolized something of their desire to be reconciled to God. Too often, many people are sorry for sin only in one sense. They're like the fellow in stateside was caught in court. He was in court for some very serious misdemeanor. And the judge said to him, have you anything to say for yourself before we sentence you? He said, yes, your honor. I am sorry I was caught. And that's where many people's sorry goes. That is not the sorrow we speak of. When we speak of repentance, and this is, applies to all our faith and all of us tonight, we're speaking of a deep sorrow that turns us from sin and turns us to God, seeking His forgiveness. But in order for this to be done, this, this claim, this justice has to be satisfied. Let me take you. Why the sacrifices? Now, we accept all of us here tonight whether we be Jew, whether we be Islam, whether we be Christian, we all accept the fact that the son of Abraham was freed by a substitute sacrifice. And the Quran speaks of it so well. Then the problem comes is, where is the problem of accepting the fact that the Lord Jesus is spoken of as a greater sacrifice when John the Baptist said of him, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He had the sign. He was born of a virgin. We accept that. He had another sign. His name would be Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. This was of the Son that was born. He was given a sign at his birth. And this is recognized by both Islam and Christians. And what is that? That is the name. The name Jesus. The name Jesus means Savior. In fact, it's better than that. It means God, our Savior. Now, he had another name that was given to him, not by his mother, not by some friends, but by God himself. His name will be Emmanuel. El is the ancient Hebrew word for God. Emmanuel means God with us. And then he himself was called Christ, which is, which is the Old Testament, the New Testament word or Greek word for the word Messiah. Messiah means the God anointed one. Now if I met a man who had that name on him and who said to me, before Abraham was, I am, now the I am was given to Moses. When Moses said to God, who I send, it's who I say that sent me, he said, you say that I am sent you. And Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, I would somehow say that that man was carrying the name of God. In fact, that was why the religious leaders of that time accused him of blasphemy. Who is this Jesus? Both Islam and committed Christians, I'm not speaking of these uh, new fellows that are trying to find out his words and change the uh, different scriptures. But both of these are committed to the fact that he is faultless, he is sinless, he was a prophet born of the Virgin Mary. We go a little further and we say he was named by God with these names indicating who he was and his nature. Jesus when he was tempted, do you know what he did when he was tempted? What was his answer when he was tempted? Some of you who know the New Testament scriptures, it says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That was the answer of the Lord Jesus, the faultless one, the sinless one, the one who could not lie, who would not tell an untruth. He was the one who foretold his death. He showed his disciples in Matthew, the 16th chapter, that he must go up to Jerusalem. Now listen to this. He must go up to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed. In fact, one of the disciples said, Oh Lord, come on, be easy on yourself. Don't take that view. But he recognized his mission as a Messiah was to be our atonement. Because we could not have an atonement. I could not atone for my sins, people. How could a, a, a wicked person say, Well, God has forgiven me. Now I'm going to atone for the bats. I can't. 
But it is God's atonement. And I do not mean by this, listen to me carefully, I do not mean by this some easy believism where you simply put up your hand and say, I've accepted Christ and therefore I'm it. No. What we're, we're saying, and this we agree with, it's submission to the will of God. It's obedience to the will of God. And this applies to every one of us, no matter what our label is. Forget our labels for a moment. When we stand before God, I'm not going to stand there as Christian. Really, I'm not. And you're not going to stand there as Islam. You're going to stand there just with your own name. And be judged for the deeds done in the body. This is why in a gathering like this, we want to not only take the different viewpoints and consider them, but have a practical application and say, may we go, and I trust that this may be a result, that we go from this place better than when we came in. Jesus said, I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Jesus said that he would be, suffer many things, be killed, and be raised the third day. Jesus also said, behold, now this is what he said to his disciples, he said, Behold, I go up to Jerusalem. All right. And the Son of Man will be betrayed by the chief priests. And, and he shall deliver him. I'm shortening it here. He shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, to scourge, to crucify him. And on the third day he shall rise again. By the way, that agrees with a statement in the Quran that the Jews did not crucify Jesus. He was delivered to the Gentiles to be crucified. If some of you think that you're a smart Gentile or a white person, it's us that bore part of that burden. But the act of crucifixion wasn't the only thing. It was the burden of the fact that he was dying, dying for the people, dying just like the lamb for the substitute. Let's go here a little further. And Luke, it tells us of Moses and Elijah. Now, we all know the prophet Moses. We know the prophet Elijah. We all recognize him. They were pictured as talking with the Lord Jesus on the mountain. And they were talking of his coming decease. And then we come to make our position clear tonight. Now, I, I'm, I'm not asking you necessarily to agree with me or disagree. I'm saying we're trying to say here, we're giving you two viewpoints. We're saying here, consider them. There they crucified him is the scripture verse that is unequivocal, no mistake. There's no mistaking it. It says there, there on, the, on that place, they crucified him. They crucified him. They didn't feed him. They didn't tangle with him. They crucified him. And then another scripture, it says he died for our sins. No mistake. It doesn't say he, he went and swooned. He died for our sins. Third one, he is risen, which gave the resurrection proof. And the uh, Christian scripture is very plain on that. But we did that raised a good point. He said that so often at the headings of the gospel, it says according to the God, Matthew and according to Mark, now, the according to there is not even in the original text. Do you know why? We don't have to sign these texts. Because these are the scriptures not given by man. They were given by God in the, in the word of God. Thank you. In the word of God, it says, Christ died according to the scriptures. He rose again according to the scriptures. That's where we take our position. And so he used, when he used several channels to reveal truth, the same as we talk, as many of you talk about the Quran, you say God used Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad. We're saying that God used Matthew, Mark, Luke, John to reveal the same truth, often the same emphasis, revealing the same thing. But they were not speaking of themselves, they were speaking because they were moved by God. We want to get another little point. 
uh, maybe I'll take you to the sign of Jonah. My good brother had Jonah well thrown over. Can we throw him over again? I, I don't know whether we should throw the poor fellow over twice. But look, I, I'll explain to you, my view to his is very similar. I believe that Jonah was a sign. All right? Then you say, what? But we were listening to Brother Didat give his explanation of it. And it was a very evil explanation. I know that. But I'm going to give you a little different view. I go down, I see Young Street out here somewhere, and they have a sign up there, Young Street. So I grab this sign, I come under. I have the sign, walk around, and I say to you, I have Young Street. You would say, you're crazy, you don't have Young Street, all you have is a sign. The sign is not the reality. The sign indicates the reality. If the reality were the same as the sign, the sign would not be a sign, it would be the reality. Thank you. What are we looking at, Jonah? We look at, let's look at this thing. One thing I want to show to you. When Jonah was thrown overboard, he went over willingly. He went over as a, as a sacrifice to save the people on the ship. They were saved because he threw the, they threw him overboard. Otherwise, that ship was going down. So they were saved by a substitute. Now, Jonah is not exactly like the Lord Jesus. And Brother Didat would agree with this, because Jonah was thrown over because he was a bad backslider. He wasn't serving God, he was going in the wrong direction. And when you backslide, God is not pleased with you. You're not in fellowship with God. But he was thrown over because he, was, he, he realized his condition, and in the whale's belly he did some repent. He say that he was thrown into the depths and brought up from the depths. Our Lord Jesus was similarly the same. Let me give you a little example. All right, we're here on the shore, and I'm going to do this very, very quickly. We throw him overboard, and we all say, yep, he's alive, there he goes. And he falls on the water. If you and I were the shipman there, we'd say, he drowned. We don't see him coming up. He's a goner. So far as our visual is concerned, then. Eh? And if we heard of him coming up somewhere else and didn't talk to him, well, we'd say, somehow that guy that drowned, he's alive again. But in a more real way, our Lord pictured Jonah three days and three nights. Now some might say, well, Jesus wasn't exactly three days and night, three nights. We start counting. But you must remember rabbinical counting or ancient counting, and even now, part of a day is counted as the whole. I was born in August. I won't tell you what date because I want you to try, try and either celebrate or curse it. Doesn't matter. But I was born in August, and uh, I wasn't born exactly at the crack of midnight. I was born somewhere in the day. But they count me as having that whole day. They don't say, "By the Wakefield, hey, you're only born in half of that day and half of the next." You see, the day counted as a whole. So our Lord was in the rabbinical structure three days, three nights. And he, it said he rose on the third day. In Esther, the book of Esther, it is similarly structured. Let me take you very quickly then. We know what crucifixion is. Crucifixion is not a holiday trip. When a fellow goes to be crucified, he doesn't say, goodbye, goodbye. I'll, I'll be back for dinner. Just get dinner ready for me. I'm just going out to be crucified. No, no. Crucifixion is execution. In fact, Jesus used that illustration for his followers. Listen to this. He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, pursue after me. What does that mean? It didn't mean he wants you to be physically crucified, but he wants you to die to the old life and come alive to the new. Is that not true of every one of us? Is there not a truth in there that no matter who you are, we have to die out to the past and come alive to the present. There should be a beginning, a change, where we come rightly related to God. But more than that, Jesus not only told that, but he gave us an example. He died 
he died for our sins and he rose again for our justification. But indeed that cites the tomb rolled back. I would suggest this, that the temple guard, which was guard Roman soldiers, were placed at that tomb. Now these fellows were neither fools nor stupid. They wouldn't let the fellow get out in a quick hurry. Nor was the fellow that was the centurion by the cross, a Roman soldier, letting him get off on the cross in the swoon. The last thing he did was thrust a spear in him. And that wasn't a, he didn't, it didn't say he thrust a, a needle or a pin in him. It was a spear, it went right in. It was thrust him through with a spear, and that's a death sentence. If anything else was, he was beaten at least 39 times with, a, with an embedded whip. We know that. And you say me, he's going to swoon and come alive again? No, because he also had this that he was bearing in himself a sense of our sins. He was dying as our lamb, as our magnificent sacrifice. Not excusing us, not excusing us, but enabling us. I'm glad Brother Didat quoted the rest of that verse in Ezekiel. Because I believe it. I believe it. And I believe this, if you don't live that way, you will never make it. He suggested that Christians have no heaven for Muslims. Why? So I'm going to be one of the Christians that's going to differ. I will tell you, the heaven is open for every man who will submit to God and walk in the light of God's truth that God reveals to him. If you repent of your sins and say, God, show me the way and lead me and mean it with all your heart, God will not fail you, nor will heaven not be closed to you. Did Jesus die? The Bible says he gave up the ghost. That means he gave up his spirit. Now, let's take a look. And I'm, how am I doing for time, brother? Good, good. I hope I'm not talking too fast. I sometimes, my wife slowed me down a little. She said, don't go at 100 miles an hour in your language, but we'll try and slow down. Listen, when he rose, there were several instances where he appeared to people, you know, and one of them was, as my brother Detat so, so, so eloquently illustrated, Mary. Mary was a person that was forgiven of many sins. And sometimes one who has been touched by God in a great way loves God more than some of us who are indolent and careless. Is that not true? And so here she was. She didn't know where the master had been taken. She'd heard something about something happening. She'd heard some talk about him not being there, but it hadn't penetrated her mind of what had happened. The jailers, had the, the, the men guarding the tomb had fled into town. The, the seals were broken, and their life was on the line, so they were paid by the religious leaders to give an excuse. But what was about her? What did he mean, touch me not? The original is, don't cling to me. She was already, you know, at his knees. She was already there. She said, oh Lord, I see you. She wasn't just standing back looking at him. She clung to him. He says, Mary, don't cling to me. Don't touch me this way. Touch me not, because I am going to I haven't, I, I haven't, I'm not going to my father right away. And we know that he went to his father. By the way, being ascended to his father, I don't know whether he did that, where you got that about dying, but I haven't found it yet. God bless you though. If you can find it, that's good. But it, generally, when they died, they gave up the ghost, or they, they bowed their heads and died. But this ascending to his father, there was one illustration in the Old Testament. Let me tell you one illustration. Elijah, the prophet, was caught up to God. He ascended. Enoch, the godly man, he ascended. He was, was not. God took him without the gate of ordinary death. Our Lord Jesus said, I've not ascended. I'm not going to leave you right away. And for a number of days, for 40 days, in fact, he gave witness to each one. He went to a room 
where these disciples were gathered in fear of the religious leaders and he goes in and says to them Shalom Salam peace be to you thanks for wisdom and they they were afraid they thought is this a ghost is this a spirit and so he said touch me look at me hear me a ghost does not have this it does not have a body like this it's not something invisible I'm not some ghostly angel he said give me some food give me some food now why 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 take food if he was you know the food he took was proof of his resurrection to my mind because when he took it and ate it he was showing he had a resurrected body oh someone says no he couldn't have eaten food because uh, uh, resurrected beings don't eat food but the Bible tells us that angels eat food when Abraham met the angels who told him the story of the wondrous thing that was going to happen in his life the blessing that was coming to him he served them food and the Bible says the Word of God says they ate it so the angels can eat food I'm sure our risen Lord could and that comforted his disciples then Paul says 500 others saw him and then at the day of Pentecost if they had a body or if they had a corpse or if they had a, a stiff of some sort why didn't they produce him Peter the coward the man who denied the Lord he was recovered and he stood on the day of Pentecost and preached and they heard him and many were converted one other thing Paul he was called Saul that was his Hebrew name he was on the way to Damascus to, to persecute and if necessary kill Christians he hated them but something happened to him on that road where he saw the light he cried out to God who art thou Lord and then he said Lord what wilt thou have me to do because that voice said I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting he had no reason to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead or that Jesus crucified because there's no advantage in it for him he would be met off as he was he had the position why in fact he paid for it with his life then we come down to one other thing but the that very kindly touched on the word anoint and I, maybe I can touch on it again now I, I'm, I don't mean to be I, I do want to be unkind please don't misunderstand me but I find it a little hard to uh, take the word anoint as rubbing a body when it comes to kings like uh, David was anointed king I don't think they gave him a rub down they just anointed him and um, and they used to anoint bodies in fact the undertaker still does some performances and in some religious faiths they still anoint the body with with uh, perfumes in honor of the dead and so this is what I see as Mary doing what does all of this mean to us though it means that here we have open to us a grand opening of coming into a vital personal relationship with God I don't care who we are you say well I don't believe I don't believe all of that I'm going to ask you just believe the one thing and say I'm going to submit to God I'm going to follow his ways I'm going to turn from everything that is wrong and don't tell me this is a Christian country this is a pagan country real Christianity does not practice wrongdoing real committed Christianity does not do that a committed Christian is one whose life has been changed by God not one who bears the label well God bless you thank you for your attention I rest my case thank you brother Diva. Thank you very much, Bishop Wakefield. Ladies and gentlemen, the final 10 minutes is for Sheikh Ahmad Didat.
Mr. Moderator and my dear brothers and sisters. I am grateful for this opportunity to complete the one hour allotted to each. My brother Wakefield has made so many points, so many statements, and in 10 minutes, no, no human being can respond to them all. But beginning at the beginning, at the very beginning, he repeated the formula, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. Implying that everybody, no exception. I mean, that's what it means in English. All means all. But this is giving a lie to Jesus. Paul is giving a lie to Jesus. Jesus Christ, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 2, verse 35, he says, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, to the Jews. So woe unto you Jews, woe unto you Jerusalem, you kill the prophets. You kill the prophets. From righteous Abel, righteous. Righteous means sinless. Abel to righteous. Zechariah. You kill the prophets. Then in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, it speaks about righteous Zechariah. The, the Zechariah was righteous in the sight of the Lord, means upright. In the book of Luke again, first chapter, it says, Elizabeth was righteous in the sight of the Lord. If a person is righteous, then he's not destined for hell, according to the testimony given by Jesus and Luke, supposed to be inspiring at the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Uh, with regards to the fulfillment of prophecies, the bishop said that, you know, Jesus was the Almighty God, the Wonderful Counselor, and he called Emmanuel, Emmanuel, called Emmanuel, Jesus. Here, I have this Bible here. It is the same Bible as I take it as you have, King James Version. There are 27 books of the New Testament, 27. And in those 27 books, Nowhere is Jesus ever addressed, he shall be called, that means you shall take his name, he shall be called Emmanuel. Nobody ever called him Emmanuel in his life. I would like to see somebody. With regards... With regards to the expression I am, I am, that Jesus said I am and God said I am, God didn't say I am. He said, Eheye, when Moses asked him, what is your name? He said, Eheye, Asher, Eheye. That is in the Hebrew language, this is what God gave him. Eheye, Asher, Eheye means I am whatever I am. Now, now the translation into the Greek Bible, in your Greek manuscripts, that I am is ho on. Ho on. I am. Ho on. But in the New Testament, the Greek translation says that I am is ego eimi. Ego eimi. Coming from the same Holy Ghost, I can't understand that if that I am stood for God, for Jesus also he should have it go on and not ego aiming. <laughs> Referring to the Quran, that the Quran says that it was the Jews they didn't kill him. And most probably it is implied that the Gentiles might have killed him. But in the verse that I read to you, 
It says, وَمَا قَتَلُهُ يَقِينًا For of a surety, they killed him not in any way, any form, either by crucifixion or by poisoning or by spearing. In no way was he killed at all. Three days and three nights. You see, the Christians say, the miracle of Jonah is not that he was dead or alive, but the time factor. He repeated the word three, four times. He said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Very, very distinct, very, very clear. Three days, three nights, three days, three nights. Don't make a mistake, 72 hours, 72 hours, three days and three nights. And I'm asking the Christians, let's see, did he fulfill that? Did he fulfill that? When was he crucified? Anybody knows? When was Christ crucified? Friday afternoon. Right? Not Friday morning, Friday afternoon. And they had to give him a burial bath, which takes a couple of hours. Then they had to put 100 pound weight of medicants around him. That's what John tells us, 100 pound of weight of medicants. And they had to put a shroud around him. And then put him into the sepulcher, it's already evening. By the time they put him into the sepulcher, it is already evening. So, Saturday, Saturday night, this is the Jewish calculation, night first, then the day. Same thing in Islam. Our Ramadan comes, the Ramadan night is the first, then the day, night, day. In, in the Jews, night, day, night, not day and night. The Western said day and night, we said no, night and day, night and day. So Saturday, Friday, Friday, according to our calendar, Friday night is supposed to be in the grave. Watch my finger, Friday night. Saturday day is still supposed to be in the grave. Saturday night, he's still supposed to be in the grave. Sunday morning, the first day of the week, Sunday morning, when Mary goes to, Mary goes to the tomb, the tomb is empty. It's already empty. Morning, in the morning, it's already empty. I'm asking how many days and how many nights. Can you people see? Can you see? No, no, can you, can, can you count? I want to know whether you can count. Look. Friday night, Saturday day, Saturday night, Sunday morning, first day of the week, the tomb is empty. How many days and how many nights? Two nights and a day. Is that the same as this? Look, is it three and three, two and one? Three and three, two and one. Is it the same? In any language, how you try, the master mathematician Einstein can't even help you here. You, you, please, 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 please. She returned, they, Jesus returns to that upper room after his alleged crucifixion. And he goes inside and wishes his disciples, Shalom Alaikum, in Hebrew, Salam Alaikum, peace be unto you. And when he said, peace be unto you, his disciples were terrified. I'm asking why were they terrified? Because when you meet your long lost master, your uncle, your grandfather, the Arab and the Jew, they embrace one another, they kisses one another. But instead of that, the disciples of Jesus were terrified. So I want to know why were they terrified? So Luke tells us that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. I'm asking, did he look like a spirit? And the Christians say no. Then why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like one? The reason is because the disciples of Jesus, they had heard from hearsay that the master was hanged on the cross. They had heard from hearsay that he had given up the ghost, meaning his spirit had come out, he had died. They had heard from hearsay that the man is buried for three days already, perhaps thinking in his grave. Such a person, you see, naturally you are terrified. So Jesus wants to assure them that it's not what they're thinking. They're thinking he's come back from the dead. So Jesus, so Jesus says, behold my hands and my feet. Have a look. For a spirit, a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. A spirit means any spirit. If I got flesh and bones, in other words, that I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook, I'm not 
resurrected, I'm not a spirit. Is that what it means in anybody's language, your language? If I got flesh and bones, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. Is that what it means in your language? In other words, he's telling you that this body that you're seeing, it is not a resurrected body, it is not a spiritual body, and the same fellow. And to assure them, further to assuage their fears, he said, have you here any meat, something to eat? And they gave him a piece of broil fish and a honeycomb, and he took it and he ate in the very side to prove what? That is a ghost, is a spook, is resurrected. I beg your pardon, Mr. Reiki. You know, each and every statement that you have made, if you start analyzing them, you have the time, you find that Jesus Christ didn't die and he was not crucified. And Mary Magdalene went and testified to the disciples that he's alive and they believe not. And the other disciples from Emmaus, they returned to the upper room, they said Jesus is alive and they believe not. And the book of Acts, it tells us that Jesus gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Alive, alive, alive. I don't know this Holy Ghost, this brother Wakefield in his book says, is, the, is God Almighty. The Holy Ghost is God. You mentioned in your book. This God Almighty, he didn't know the difference between alive and resurrected. He didn't know the word resurrection. If he was resurrected, he said, he's resurrected, he's resurrected. And he says, alive, 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 alive. And you say, he's resurrected, resurrected, resurrected. Amazing, amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that these two scholars have exemplified themselves in championing the causes of their respective religions, and I think they need your applause. We shall entertain questions at this time and like I've mentioned before, you will line in single files, you will address your question to the respective speakers. We shall not entertain any statements from you. Please be brief and ask your question directly and as quickly as possible. After you have concluded with your question, you may step away from the microphone and if you do have another question, then you will have to queue up again at the back of the line. There are four microphones provided for your convenience, two on the upper aisles and two in the center aisles. <laughs> Remember, the questions must be put politely and directed to the speakers. We will take the first question from speaker number one. Good, thank you. Okay. Um, it, the question would be, if you had a grandson who came here to Toronto, played hockey in this arena for the Toronto Maple Leafs, um, and he got a penalty, and the rule was he had to go to the penalty box, but there was an exception that if he was a goalie, someone could go to the penalty box and take his place, would you say to him it's okay to have a substitute, or would you say no, that, that's not fair? There is no country on earth where if you commit murder, they hang somebody else as a substitute. No country on earth. We will entertain the second question. Those who have a question for Bishop General Wakefield. Bishop Wakefield, I heard of your crucifixion of Christ, but I'd like to know why the Gospel of Barnabas was omitted from the Bible, which says so much about Christ and his crucifixion. The Gospel of Barnabas. 
The Gospel of Barnabas came at much later date. It was not written during the biblical period and therefore had no, um, no occasion to be included in the Bible. In fact, the Gospel of Barnabas is contrary also to the Koran. Thank you. Next question for Sheikh Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, Brother Ahmed Didat, uh, did you have any writings about, about specifically the crucifixion of Jesus, son of Mary? Bless him. Did you have any writings about him? And where can we find such a thing, such a book or such a writing? Yes, I have written a book entitled Crucifixion or Crucifixion. Sounds the same. In English, it sounds like crucifixion or crucifixion. It sounds the same. But in writing, the first crucifixion is F-I-X-I-O-N, meaning to fix a person on the cross and kill. And the second crucifixion is F-I-C-T-I-O-N, fiction. Filthy. So that is the title of the book. And in that book, I'm giving more than 30 different reasons to prove that this was not a crucifixion, but it was a fiction. As the Quran says, Illa Tibazan. We'll take the question up from the sister. My question is addressed to the bishop. Given the anthropomorphic nature of Christianity, how do you explain the striking similarities between the accounts of Jesus' crucifixion and pre-Christian mythological figures such as Mithras from Persia, who was born of a virgin, was the son of God, died for the sins of mankind, went to hell uh, for three days and arose, or the pre-Christian Greek figure of Dionysus, who was also a son of God, died for the sins of mankind, was hung on a tree, Excuse and arose... Me, sister. Yes? One short question. Okay, I would just like to hear your explanation concerning the duplicity between uh, the account of Jesus and these pre-Christian mythological figures. You raised right, an interesting question, and of course that would apply equally to the Quran, because we're applying a similar figure. They were both born of a virgin in both records. Why would there be those records? Because within the prophetic records of the Holy Scriptures accepted by the Jewish faith Christ was forecast to be born of a virgin 700 years before his birth prior to that within the Psalms and we're not exactly knowing how many hundreds of years before that there is still another reference and you go back further and even in Deuteronomy, the book uh, of Moses, uh, you have another reference to uh, coming Christ or Messiah. So that would, uh, if they wanted to, many things have been borrowed from others. So I think it's a borrowing. Thank you. We'll take a question from the aisle up front. Uh, the topic you choose both of you, comparing Islam with Christian, raised three, co three questions on my mind. First, if any of you win actually in this discussion, what kind of problem in Muslim and the Christian society will be solved? Second, you don't think so this kind of old discussion direct people away from the problem which they are facing right now, such as racism, um, inequality of women and man and, and etc. And the third is... One question, please. They are One so question, late. please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my dear brother, I don't know whether you're talking as a Muslim or as a Christian. Are you a Muslim or a Christian? Or are you neither? What are you? Uh, you I don't to say it's very important excuse me. to no, know me. I'm no, Muslim no. or Christian. You see? Because you are neither fish nor fowl. You are not a fish and you are not a fowl. And you are asking a question. Why don't you identify yourself whether you are a Christian? Then I can tell you this is the foundation of Christianity. Next we'll have a question from you. And if you are a Muslim, I say this is what the Quran says. You are supposed to go and tell people Wama kataluhu, wama salabuhu, that they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. Either way. So, 
you are neither fish nor fowl, I don't think you deserve an answer. Okay. Um, go ahead. Would it be all right if I read that passage? No, you have to, you have to make your question. Okay. Um, the question is, in chapter 21-1 in the book of Genesis, it says, And the Lord visited Sarah, and the Lord did unto Sarah, and, and Sarah conceived as, as the Lord has promised. So why don't the Christians also believe that Isaac was son of God? Perhaps I can explain that by my own example. My father was 63 when I was born, and I was not expected. But I came in answer to prayer, and God visited our family, not in a miraculous virgin birth, but in enabling my mother and my father to have a son in their old age. Thank you. Do you have a question for Sheikh Dida up in the aisles? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, because I couldn't ask uh, our guest, Mr. Wakefield, I'm going to ask Sheikh Ahmed Didat. Mr. Ahmed Didat, brother, can you tell us how can a man die in five hours when he is on the cross? We know that um, for a man to die in a cross, it's going to take him at least two or three days. That's one. The second thing... That's it. No, no. It's next, just, uh, just, next question. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, as a Muslim, I know like we don't support anything about gay, but the Christian faith, right now I know they divided. Some bishops still still support about gay. So what do you think about them? Now, w would you pardon me by not say I didn't quite get your. I have a bad accent too, so I'm not reflecting on you, understand? Yeah. What I mean is, right now, in this society, yes, yes. the Christians, they divided, and there are some bishops supporting the gay society. Personally, you, what do you think about them, the bishop and the gay society? All right, I, I'll speak very frankly on that. The Bible, the Word of God, is very specific against the gay society. And the bishop or the church or the minister who says he supports sodomites as being blessed by God is, and I say this kindly, cursed by God. Do you have a question for Sheikh Dida? Do you have a question? Go ahead, please. <laughs> Mr. Dida, we are now in uh, 1994. Uh, the crucifixion, and obviously everybody is agreeing that it never occurred, or at least that's what your premise is. The best person to ask would be an eyewitness concerning what actually happened, and if we actually could bring him back in time and put him in this place as an eyewitness, that would be, of course, the best witness, and we would have to agree, yes, this did occur. We have a, a testimony of not only 12, but over 500 people who literally saw him, touched him, handled him. Each of them, uh, the original 12 apostles, of the 12, 11 gave their lives as a testimony saying that yes, he did die, he, did, he was buried, he did rise again. They all are the best witnesses. If we were to bring them in this, this Colosseum, they would be the best witnesses. How can you therefore cast aside the greatest witness uh, in support that not only did they give their lives in sacrifice as martyrs, but they would never die to defend a lie, how can then you say that their testimony is invalid? My dear brother, better than getting those people back from the graves and asking them, you have a written record which nobody can go against. It's already written there in black and white and this is your witnesses. 
And according to these witnesses of yours, we are questioning them that Jesus is telling you that a spirit has no flesh and bones and that the resurrected body gets spiritualized. That's also your witnesses tell you that. The resurrected bodies get spiritualized. Paul says that, if you remember, he says that which is sown, what you sow, a person who is dead and you sow, you sow him, in, that means you bury, he's sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. Then Jesus also testifies to that fact that the resurrected bodies will be spiritualized. In the Gospel of St. Luke, they come to Jesus and they ask him the question. He said, Master, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, there was a woman among us and that woman has seven husbands according to a Jewish practice that if one brother dies and if there are no offsprings then the second fellow takes her to wife and when he fails and if he dies the third fellow and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and seven guys Jesus they're telling Jesus that seven guys had this one woman they had her this is what the Bible says seven had her there was no problem on this earth because it was all one by one one after the other but they want to know from him that at the resurrection which guy is going to have her because they all had her here because once you have a woman that closeness is created you recognize her on the other side he says my wife may throw my dear my sweetheart there will be a war in heaven between the seven brothers fighting for this one woman that's the picture they are giving him they want to know which guy is going to have her on the other side because they all had her here. This is scriptural language. They all had her, they want to have her on the other side. In answer to that Jesus says, neither shall they die anymore. Once you are resurrected, you will be, they will be immortalized. This is a mortal body which has got its mortal needs, food, shelter, clothing, sex, rest. Without these things, no Pakistan is left. No Red Indians left, no Canadians, nobody. No Europeans, no Irishmen, nobody. <laughs> nobody left. <laughs> also no six, no more six. You know. All will be six. <laughs> no. Neither shall they die anymore. For they are equal unto the angels. Meaning once they are resurrected, they will be angelized. They will be spiritualized. They will be spiritual creatures. They will be spirits. For they are equal unto the angels and the children of God. For such are the children of the resurrection. Spirits! Jesus says, a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. I am not what you are thinking. What's wrong with you fools? Handle me and see. Handle me and see. For a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. What is he proving? And they believe not for joy. The Bible says, I am only quoting. And they believed not for joy, means they were overjoyed and wondered what happened man, we thought the man was dead and buried. So he said, have you here any meat, something to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb and he took it and he ate in the very side to prove what that is a spirit, is a ghost, is a spook, what is he proving? He said, I'm a saint fellow man, damn fools, what are you afraid of me for? And again and again you find in the experience, he never showed himself to the Jews, if he had conquered death, if he had, was resurrected, he would have conquered death. He would have gone to the temple of Jerusalem and told the Jews, says, here I am. Remember I told you, the sign of Jonah, what is going to happen to happen to me? Here I am. He said, we'll kill you. He said, go ahead and do what you like. But because he's resurrected. You can't kill a resurrected body. Because the Bible says, it is ordained to all men once to die and after that the judgment. You can't die twice. So, the man would have been invincible and he would have proved his case but instead he's ever in hiding, he's ever in disguise because he had escaped death by the skin of his teeth. In all fairness to the people who are standing behind you, I will reiterate that if you have a question it has to be directed alternately to the speakers and it, have to, it has to be one question only and as short as possible. No statesman will be allowed. Do you have a question for Bishop Wakefield? No. Yes, I do. Microphone number two, do you have I, a question? Go yes, ahead, I please. Do. 
General, General Wakefield, the Bible and the Quran says, you will not write the book with your own hand, accord, with your own hand according to your needs. In today's, we see people ordaining women as priests, the church being quiet about gays and lesbians taking over the world. We want to know what's your stand on this and why are you quiet? America, everywhere, every, nobody's talking about it. Thank you. You haven't listened to me very long, <laughs> but it's true that what we are facing in America and perhaps in some areas of Islam too, unfortunately, is nominal religion. And I do not support it. I have no truck or tracer. And I have no fear nor no doubt in saying that lesbianism is wrong and homosexuality in any shape or form is wrong and no church or any religious group has any right supporting it. Now they, they tell us, uh, and maybe I just add this a little, a little add there because this question has been twice here. They say, well, some are born with this propensity. Well, uh, Irish people are born with bad tempers, but it doesn't mean we go around exploding. We have to learn by God's grace to control our temper. And these fellows have to learn by God's grace to change their lives. And by God's grace they can. It's not that we hate a person, but we hate the deeds that drive that person to a final judgment where God will say, depart from me. Thank you. You have a question for Mr. Didat. Mr. Mr. Didat, why does God demand animal sacrifices in the Old Testament? When Abraham offered the ram, why does God demand animal sacrifices, if not to typify Jesus in the future? Please, please answer this. The same Bible says, God speaking, I need no blood. I don't need the blood of animals, less of human beings. This sacrifice of Abraham was a drama being enacted to teach the people that God needs no human blood. You see, because in the time of Abraham, in the Ur of the Chaldees, these people made human sacrifices. They sacrificed the sons to God and they sacrificed the daughters to God. Just telling them, don't do that is not good enough for man. You have to enact a story. And this is the story which God Almighty enacted for mankind that look, he orders Abraham to sacrifice his son. And when he's ready, the Quran says, God says that look, it is your, 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 your willingness that I was interested in. Not the, the flesh of Isaac or even of sheep or goats. This is just to symbolize this is to symbolize his willingness that we are prepared to cut an animal because it symbolizes our own sacrifice. This animal is ours and we are making that sacrifice. And Jesus Christ, he gave a beautiful parable of the prodigal son. That a father had two sons. And one of these sons is telling the father, he said, look daddy, give me whatever belongs to me, my inheritance, and I want to go out into the world and be independent. So the father pleases, gives to the son whatever he was entitled to. And this guy goes to a foreign land, he joins bad company, drunkards, adulterers, gamblers and all, and he goes into the mire, into the gutter, most despicable sort of life. In that position, he realizes that if he had been with his father, he would have been better off. So he makes a return home, says Jesus. This is what Jesus says. And while the son is coming home and the father sees him at a distance, the father runs. The father runs to the son and embraces him and he says that this my son was dead, is now alive, he was lost, he is now found. And he tells the son who is at home, it's a sacrifice the fatted calf to celebrate the return of the prodigal. This is the parable of the, that Jesus gave about ourselves and God. God is the father. He's got two types of children. One who is upright and with the God and the other one who drifts off. 
and the one that gives up, if he makes up his mind to return, the Father, God Almighty, he runs to you and he accepts you with open arms. And he makes the sacrifice, the sacrifice is his own. He's not telling the son, he says, look, you squandered my money, now you stay with the pigs for seven years, look after my pigs, and after you have finished seven years of indentured labor, then you come into the house, nothing of the kind. This is God. In other words, as soon as the person who repents, God Almighty is prepared to accept him, and he needs no blood, he needs no sacrifice, he needs your willingness to return. Do you have a question for Bishop? Yeah. I like to know why is in the Bible then the Jesus says to you guys not to Hindus not to the Muslim not to the Jews that on the day of the judgment when you people the Christian get up and say that my Lord did I not preach in your name and Jesus said to you depart from me foresight it is in your Bible that's right he doesn't say it just to Christians he says it to anyone who attempts to prophesy or act in the name of God falsely anyone do you think that because you're some other religion that if you attempt to act in the name of God falsely that you're going to get by with it at the judgment you're mistaken my dear friend we all have to give the same account he doesn't use the, the word Christian only occurs five times in the Bible and he does not use the word Christian in that instance thank you microphone number four do you have a question for Sheikh Didat Mr. Dida, this is a question. Jesus said, those who are my sheep hear my voice. Those that are not my sheep hear not my voice. What do you think of that? What do you make of it? John chapter 10, verse 23. <laughs> and Jesus walked in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said, How long does thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. So Jesus says, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they be a witness of me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. In this, I and my Father are one. In this, not in power, not in knowledge, not in anything, but in this, that once the man has accepted faith, I, as a prophet of God, see to it that the man remains in faith, and God Almighty, who also sees faith, that they remain in faith. We are one in this. There's a sister holding a child in one of the aisles. The sister with the child. There's a sister with the child in one of the aisles. Would you come forward, please? Do you have a question for Bishop Wakefield? Assalamu alaikum. In the beach, uh, uh, when he was talking, he was saying, Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, as a uh, He's the same as a lamb or the sheep sacrificed in Sayyidina Ibrahim. How you can say something like this and he is your God or even your son of God? I was quoting, I was quoting from the scripture where John the Baptist, who is the prophet, said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. I also quote from the scripture where it tells us all we like sheep have gone astray. It pictures us as sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Also Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I give my life for the sheep. So there's the illustration of sheep is all woven in there. It was an honorable illustration because a sheep was considered without blemish, was considered pure, it was not a pig, it was a sheep, and was considered pure without blemish, and that was why it was offered. Thank you. Microphone number four, do you have a question for Sheikh Didat? I have, I have a question for Didat. Assalamu alaikum. The Christian believe that Jesus is either a son of God or God. What did Jesus say that in the Bible? 
And a question, where... a question, brother, a question, not a statement. Okay, where did, where did Jesus say that he is God? And where did he say about the prophecy of Muhammad in the Bible? Jazakallah. Jesus never said he is God anyway, in any Bible on earth. He hasn't. I have been asking my audiences in South Africa where the percentage of Christians is far greater than what I can sense here. That if you can show me any way in your Bible, any Bible, any Bible on earth, you have hundreds of different versions. Any version where Jesus says, I'm God, or where he says, worship me. I said, I would be prepared to accept him as God, and I would be prepared to worship him. I don't speak for my brothers. They speak for themselves. But you show me in your book, any book, any Bible, and the Christian is asking me, you mean to say it's not there? I say, show me. There isn't. On the contrary, Jesus says, my father is greater than I. My father is greater than all. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. No way, no way does Jesus say, I'm God. No way does he say, worship me. Microphone number one, do you have a question for a bishop? Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Bishop, uh, I would like to know, and I, I want you to clarify this. Uh, is Jesus a God, or Son is God, or part of the uh, three so-called gods, or is he a prophet? Uh, I, can you, um, you, you, you almost lost me somewhere in that list. Uh, you're saying, can I re rephrase your question to try and get, see if I'm getting you? Yeah, I want to know if, uh, I know what Jesus is, but I want to ask Repeat you. Repeat the question, brother. Okay, is Jesus a God, or Son is God, or part of the three so-called gods, or is he a prophet? All right, first of all, we affirm as Christians, one God. We affirm that as strongly as any Islamic person would. Second, the word son of God, same as son of man, does not mean less than. It's putting of equal nature to. For instance, if I said we're, we're son of man, it doesn't mean we're sub subcontract bunch, you know. It doesn't mean that you're less than a man. It means you're of the equal nature too. Your third uh, question was, was he three gods? No. The scriptures, as the Christian understands them, teaches God in a plurality of persons but in unity. The Old Testament says, let us make man in our own image. The Elohim is a plural word. Uh, Ichad is a plural word, which means there is the Lord our God is one. It means the Lord our God is unity. I was a member of a family where we had three in a family, but it wasn't three families. We were one family. Now that may give you just a brief understanding. Thank you. Do you have a question for uh, Sheikh Didat? No. Okay, do you have a question for Sheikh Didat? Can you come forward? To Mr. Didat. Is there anywhere in the Bible mentioned that Christ was God, the God of Moses, of David, Noah, Abraham, and Adam, and that he was the creator of this universe and creation? No, there is no such thing. Also with regards to the Trinity. See, the Christian says that God is in three persons. And they say in the formula that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods, but one God. They continue in the Catechism, in the Book of Instructions, that the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty. But they are not three Almighty, but one Almighty. It continues that the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. But they are not three persons, but one person. Am I correct? I don't know the book of catechism.
I am asking the Christian, the Westerner, who speaks English, you said person, 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 but not three person, but one person. I said, I want to know what language are you talking? Is that English? I'm asking, is that English? That's gibberish. Person, 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 but not three person, but one person. And Bishop Wakefield, in his book, in his book, it just happens to be here. He, he's written about the doctrine of the Trinity, the attributes of God, Trinity, the triune God. And at the end of his essay on the Trinity, Bishop says, he says, yet there are not three gods, but only one, one God only, as seen in the previous section. Therefore, therefore we conclude that there are three persons in the unity of the Godhead. And the support is 1 John 5, 7. 1 yeah. John yes. 5, 7. One second. Second. One second. One John five seven. What I'm asking is that one John five seven is not in my Bible. I want you to find that for me in this Bible of mine. It, uh, there have been several omissions in some of the modern versions. I don't agree with them, so that's where I stand. So I'm asking who omitted that? That verse is thrown out as a fabrication in the RSV, Revised Standard Version. Yes, I understand. Who, who did this Revised Standard Version? Not Jews, not Hindus, not Muslims, but 32 scholars of the highest eminence, Christian scholars of the highest eminence. <laughs> 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations of Christianity. They threw it out as a fabrication. And the whole Christian world is come sucking a fabrication and creating a new Godhead, a three in one. This is the Bible. Thank you. I, uh, I happen to disagree with those scholars because scholars can be mistaken. And sometimes, sometimes in the defense of truth, of course, my whole truth wasn't hung on that one verse. I just used that at the one end there. Better do that. That was written 47 years ago, by the way. <laughs> but I, I'm glad he refers to it. He's giving you a lot of good scriptures tonight. That's terrific. Uh, now, that one verse is not the only one I've used. But I will say this, and I say this respectfully, that because a man claims to be a Christian scholar or become from a mainline Christian denomination, does not mean that he is a committed Christian any more than a person who says, well, I'm Islam and doesn't practice. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in view of the fact that tomorrow Sheikh Ahmad Didat will be debating in the Civic Auditorium in Ottawa, we will have to entertain only four more questions tonight. So we shall take one from each of the microphones, one directed to each of the speakers alternately, and four more questions only allowed. We'll start with the upper microphone. Microphone number one. Mr. Didat, we have covered a lot of ground where there are things in common with Christianity and Islam. My question is, Surely the veracity of Jesus Christ as a prophet is what we are discussing. And if in fact he said that he was God, if in fact he forgave sin, if in fact he guaranteed that he would die, rise again for the atonement of the world, then either we have to accept that he was indeed a prophet, and the Old Testament, as you know, says that to test a prophet is that his word is altogether true or he was deluded or he was a liar. My question to you, sir, is was Jesus a prophet and did he speak the truth? <laughs> Jesus Christ, not only a prophet, but he's one of the mightiest messengers of God in Islam.
and what he spoke, he spoke the truth. But people have a tendency of seeing, reading into scripture what is not there. I'm telling you, repeated the phrase, Jesus claiming to be God, I'm telling you, here yeah, the Bible is here, if you haven't got one, come down and by the, other, by the time the other questions are being asked, you find that verse for me and I will give you my hand and take me to be baptized. Come, come down here and show me in your Bible. Question for Bishop Wakefield on microphone two. Yes. Mr. Wakefield, I have a question. If I paint a big, big picture in which I drew Jesus Christ, the Lord, and he is crucified on the cross with the thrones on his head. What do you think the title of this picture would be? Do you think it's love or wisdom? Thank you. I am sorry I would not do go for drawing a picture. I must speak reverently. I do not mean making graven image or any likeness to either worship or to any creature here on earth to worship by. You understand. Do you have a question for Sheikh Dida? As you can see, I'm a Muslim, and I also have an open mind. I, I read the Bible, and uh, many Bibles, as a matter of fact. So the question is, I read one time a Bible, which was f from Greece, and half of the Bible was talking about Greek people. Now, if the Bible is Word of God, does, does the Word of God only talk about, uh, in a half of the Bible, about the Greek people? That I could not believe. So could you answer that, please? That's his problem, not mine. Maybe I think you have mistaken the Jews for Greeks. Because <laughs> again and again, Jesus Christ speaks to his people, telling them, I'm not sent but under the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's telling his disciples, go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, meaning the non-Jews, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go ye rather unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, woe unto you, hypocrites. This is, I'm quoting Matthew chapter 23. Right. Woe unto you, hypocrites, you generation of wipers, you brood of snakes, woe unto you, hypocrites six times in one chapter six times this is his addressing the jews the jews the jews and to my knowledge not the greeks but now i was just reminded that this book here i have written this book called the choice the choice between islam and christianity and this book is available outside this will give you information on what the bible says about muhammad muhammad the natural successor to christ Muhammad the greatest and Al-Quran the miracle of miracles. This one also a hardcover book, gold embossed, South African gold. <laughs> and it's being sold for $15. Uh, those of you who can afford it, buy one, buy two, give it to your friends, non-Muslim friends, your employers, your employees, and it'll be a better gift than giving them 15 rand, you know, for Christmas box. Give this book. The final question, microphone number four for Bishop Wakefield. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, the question directed to the bishop. Uh, Mr. Dida has proven to us step by step with clear, dif uh, with clear evidence that Jesus was not crucified. So how do you have to explain with the statement of Paul when he said in the first Corinthian 15, 14 when he said, if, if Christ is not risen from the dead, our teaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Thank you. Thank you for that very clear statement of what Paul said. I agree with it. I'm not too sure, at least not to me, I'm afraid uh, Brother D. that I enjoyed the scripture he quotes, but I can't say he's proven beyond any shadow of a doubt uh, that the resurrection or the crucifixion did not place, take the place. You know, it is difficult to prove nothing. And uh, he's made a very noble effort, and I admire him for it. But it, uh, to me, it's a question not proven because every copy of the New Testament, where it was written by different ones at different 
uh, you know, within the early period, they all say he was crucified and he rose. So I go by their record. They were eyewitnesses. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of an historic occasion. The symposium on the topic was Christ crucified. You are the jurors. You make the decisions. You formulate the opinions in your minds because these two gentlemen have done exceptionally well in giving you the facts and in outlining to you their religious convictions. It has been my pleasure to be the moderator and I hope I've done a fair job. I want to thank Bishop General Wakefield, Mrs. Wakefield, and all the members that have come to join in this symposium. And also to Sheikh Ahmad Didat and Yusuf Didat and all the members of his gathering that has joined him, including Consul General of South Africa and all the other Consul Generals who are present here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this symposium and I'd like to make a correction that the debate in Ottawa is on Tuesday. It has been such a hectic night tonight that I've lost track of time. It has been nevertheless an informative and a very interesting one. I've been requested by Riaz Ghali, Chairman of Islamic Solidarity Front and Vice President of Canada, Sri Lanka Muslim Association of Ontario to take two minutes and to address you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this program. To each and every one of you, may God Almighty bless you and keep you in good health. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.